artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 187. Today we will conclude the interview with Michal Kuszynski, who is Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. He was behind the first press article, appearing in The Guardian in 2015, warning against Cambridge Analytica, which the next year triggered a scandal that involved the unauthorized acquisition of personal data from millions of Facebook users that impacted the Brexit and 2016 U.S. presidential election voting. Michal also co-authored the book Modern Psychometrics and has published over 90 peer-reviewed papers in prominent journals such as Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Nature Scientific Reports, and others that have been cited over 18,000 times. He has a PhD in psychology from the University of Cambridge, as well as master's degrees in psychometrics and social psychology. In 2015, he received a Rising Star Award from the Association of Psychological Science and in 2023, an Early Achievement Award from the European Association of Personality Psychology. So, eminently well suited to talking to us about exactly what was going on with Cambridge Analytica, which is what we talked about last week and the three-way relationship between humans, social media, and AI. Before we get into the interview, the term stochastic parrot will come up. And if you haven't heard that before, it was coined by Emily Bender in a 2021 paper that also included Tim Gebru in its authors, who has spoken publicly about the term considerably. It describes how large language models generate output according to some measure of randomness. That's the stochastic part and are doing so based on regurgitating their training data, albeit with some transformation along the way, hence Parrot. This characterization is now taking some heat for being too dismissive, or that the large language models have overtaken it. Let's get back to the interview with Michal Kroszynski. I'd like to pivot here to the impact of large language models you have been saying things recently about connecting those and something called the theory of mind. And perhaps you could, first of all, acquaint us with the theory of mind and then lead on to where do large language models stand with respect to that, in your opinion? Well, so I started, and that's what we talked about for the last few minutes, I started with looking at how companies and governments are using those modern machine learning or artificial intelligence models to understand humans better. But in the process, and I think this is just a notion that is shared by many people, I've noticed that those models themselves became so complicated and so interesting and, and started expressing properties very similar to, in some ways, to properties that before were used to experience only in the context of humans. So to give you a very simple example, we know that those language models have biases and stereotypes. And they learn those biases and stereotypes when they learn how to mock human language. But it turns out that this is just one of the explanations. It turns out that neural networks in general, including human brain neural network or animal brain neural network, but also artificial neural networks, when those networks learn how to deal with the tasks that are presented to them, how to simplify and analyze the input that comes from the environment and process it to produce some plan of action or some prediction or some piece of language. They necessarily simplify and turn and extract patterns from what's around them. And stereotypes, biases, prejudice are essentially pattern prediction, pattern recognition processes that went wrong, went rogue, became counterproductive. So what I'm trying to say here is that the bias in large language models and other AI models is not just the function of training data. We can make perfectly fair and clear training data, which by, 
well, we could attempt to do it. It's not possible to have data fully free of bias. But even then, we will discover that both human brains and artificial brains will still have biases and stereotypes. So we should think about those problems, not only in the context of trying to minimize biases in humans and in large language models, but also creating systems and procedures where even a biased human or even a biased large language model will not be causing harm to others because of their biases. So that's hmm. one example of a lesson and one example of a type of an issue that my current research is focusing on. Now, there are other interesting, as we call them, emergent properties of our neural artificial networks, apart from biases and stereotypes. And an example that you mentioned is fear of mind. Now, fear of mind is not a scientific theory, it's a theory that we all have. So humans essentially have a theory that other people that they interact with have their own minds. And by the way, this is not such an obvious thing. Most of the animals, otherwise really smart, do not really act under the assumption that the things that they interact with have their own minds. Little humans don't do it. Children below the age of five or six don't really understand that other things in that environment, other humans, the parents, have their own minds. They just treat it as this kind of awkward element of their environment. In fact, very small children don't even see a difference between themselves and the rest of the environment. They just swim in the soup of information, not being able to draw clear boundaries between themselves and things and other people. So it was interesting to see, and that's what my research is focusing on, that this theory of mind, this ability to understand that other beings can have their own independent minds seems to have spontaneously emerged in large language models, the most recent large language models. And that just opens up so much conversation around, are they imitating that? And does it make a difference that it's an imitation? In other words, is the imitation indistinguishable from the real thing? Is that a conversation in your research? Yes, of course. So the question here is whether it's just the parrot that mindlessly is repeating something that it learned from humans, or is it that it genuinely has an ability and some understanding, some form of understanding of what's going on. And it seems, and I can talk more about this, that the latter is true. So fear of mind and other mental characteristics are kind of controversial, and people have this quasi-religious approach to things such as consciousness or free will and so on. But let us look at something simpler, like an ability to play chess. Now, we all remember how in 1997, Deep Blue, IBM's Deep Blue, won a chess match against Kasparov. Now, most of the people don't know how it happened exactly, but how it happened is that Deep Blue had this enormous capability of predicting millions of future positions on a chessboard. So Deep Blue could look at the chessboard and then in its memory and thanks to its processors, it could predict 200 million moves per second. So it would just start moving the chess pieces on the board as quickly as it could, 200 million moves per second, and then would try to figure out which of the chain of moves was most beneficial for its own side. Now, additionally, IBM Deep Blue had a great, not perfect, but huge memory of all of the games played by chess masters in the past. And it had memorized also a lot of openings and a lot of endings. So it didn't have to even predict anything at the beginning and the end of the match because we just play from the memory. Now, if you ask me and if you ask most of other psychologists or philosophers of mind whether Deep Blue knew how to play chess or was just stupidly hacking the game, there's a general agreement that Deep Blue was just hacking this game. Deep Blue didn't know how to play chess it was just a calculator that was stupidly testing all of the future positions and then picking the best move. Now, for many years after 1997, not much has happened in the world of chess, but in 2018, so very recently, researchers at DeepMind, they took a very different approach to teaching computer how to play chess. What they did is they took 
two neural networks, which are simple mathematical models of how neural networks work in humans or other animals having brains. And then they would put those two neural networks in front of a chessboard and without giving them any explanation about what is a good move, what is a bad move, any memory of old games, any advice, any, you know, uh, hints, hey, you should do this or you should that. So essentially without any external influence, they would just have those two neural networks play chess with each other. And then each time a network managed to win a game, a network would be rewarded and the neurons that voted for the winning moves would be strengthened and the voting powers would be increased very much as it happens in the human brain, where if your actions end with the desirable outcome, you're happy, your brain gets flooded with neurotransmitters and hormones, and then the neurons that voted for the ultimately successful course of action get more voting power next time. So using what we call reinforcement learning without any strategy or any explanation of how you should play chess, after a few millions of of games, those machines move from being completely stupid and naive to being kind of okay. And then a few more millions of games, and suddenly they became chess geniuses. And when I say chess geniuses, I mean humans have no absolutely no chance of winning with any of these networks. In fact, the chances of a human winning is like one in a thousand in a match, which essentially effectively means never. Now, here the situation is completely different than in a context of IBM Deep Blue. We still have simple rules and a machine following those rules, but those rules are not on the level of a neural network. Each individual neuron in this deep neural network is just interpreting some input from the lower layers of neurons or from the chessboard and then following some simple rules that it has developed in training and then passing the information on. Very much, by the way, like individual neurons in our brains. Now, individual neurons in a brain of Kasparov don't even know that Kasparov is playing chess. Individual neurons in Kasparov brains are not conscious, don't have feelings, do not know or understand anything. Individual neurons in our brains are just relatively simple biological robots, biological machines that interpret an input that they get from the environment and then follow a simple rule ledger to either pass the signal on or not. And from putting, well, in the context of a human brain, 85 billions of such neurons together, where each one of them is just relatively simple and basic, it doesn't have any higher mental properties, what happens is that on the level of the network, those higher mental properties emerge. Consciousness, goal-oriented behaviors, strategic thinking, knowledge and understanding of chess. None of this can be ascribed to an individual neuron. All of those can be ascribed to the brain of Kasparov's. Now, I believe that the same happens in modern artificial neural networks. No individual neuron knows how to play chess. All of them just follow simple instructions. And yet, when you add millions of those neurons, higher functions emerge. Maybe not consciousness today, quite unlikely consciousness today, but perhaps understanding how to play chess, intuitions related to playing chess, understanding of language rather than just ability to simply parrot a human mimic, a human language. Maybe figure of mind or ability to understand. Let's say that if you have a story and in this story, there are two characters and one of those characters knows something that the other character doesn't know. Now, when this character is sharing their privileged knowledge, large language models, and we know this because we can observe them doing it, will correctly assume that the other character is going to be surprised because they didn't know it. It's just so obvious to us humans. And yet it's not obvious to human children, not to mention that it wouldn't be obvious to otherwise really smart and talented other animals, such as elephants or apes or dolphins, who are very smart and very apt and yet do not have this uniquely, so far, uniquely human ability, which is theory of mind. And speaking for myself and a great many other people, the rug got yanked out from under us last November when ChatGPT dropped. And a whole bunch of the ways that we had found the limitations of large language models until then 
were erased, i.e. through Winograd schemas at it. It passed them. The other kinds of tests that had usually worked to defeat or expose something as not being a human on inside the box just weren't working. It's very hard now to articulate what those limitations are. I can find them, but it's very hard for me to describe, to formalize what the limitations of those models are. And in your role as psychologist, psychometrician, how do you evaluate their capabilities? And well, how much of a surprise was their development to you? Well, without a question, GPT-4 and similar models are the most competent language users on this planet. Now, there's a better poet than chat GPT. There is a better software engineer. There's a better interpreter. There's a better novelist. But none of them, while they are mastering their own discipline, none of them can match GPT-4 and other similar models across all of the other applications of language that those models can engage in. Not only this, none of them can match the speed, which is also part of the ability with which those models can achieve their tasks. Now, we keep forgetting about this, but speed matters as well, right? Even a great novelist or a great poet takes quite some time to write their poem or their book. It may take a year or two to write a novel. Now, a novel of maybe inferior, somewhat inferior quality could be written in mere seconds by a model, which at the same time is chatting with millions of people on some other subject. So without a question, we're already facing a system that has superior language, overall language abilities. And we shouldn't forget that language is a funny task because no one said that whatever language you're using, be it Polish or English or French, those are not some ultimate ways of communicating that the universe has to offer. This is just how we tend to communicate. And in fact, if you are too good of a language user, people kind of stop connecting with you. You need to be on my level in terms of language. If you start using too complex words, if you speak too quickly, if you do not explain your thoughts slowly enough for me, I will just not be able to keep up. So here, we are not training those models to be as smart as possible. We kind of training them to be at our level, at our level of stupid. And we don't want them to be too smart because then we would just lose the ability to interact with them. But in many other tasks, the sky's the limit. In training those models to program computers and control computers, they don't need to slow down to be at our level. They can learn how to program those computers at the level that is not accessible to us, to human software engineers. They can translate from English to French, but they also can translate from English to whatever your fridge or your car or your computer language is currently implemented in those machines. Moreover, those models that were trained to mock human language, to chat with us, essentially, they also, in the process, learned how to reason, how to solve problems, how to retain knowledge. Look, no one trained ChatGPT4 to be able to solve reasoning tasks or to be able to know a lot about medical issues that people have. Those abilities emerged spontaneously as a byproduct of those models getting better at predicting next word in a sentence, essentially having a chat with us. And it has been surprising to many people at the beginning, but of course now we're looking back and seeing, yeah, of course, one shouldn't be surprised by that. If you want to train a robot that is really good at chatting with us, this robot better knows how to reason because we expect reasoning from our conversation partners. This robot better understands emotions and is able to express emotion-like states. In other words, have something like empathy and have something like emotions simply because we like chatting with others that can empathize with us and that can react appropriately with their own Mm. emotions. But we increasingly use those models to help us to learn about our medical issues or maybe solve some business or personal problems. So again, we want those models to be as good at problem solving and advice as possible. So just simply by rewarding those models in training for being a good conversation partner for a human, 
we inadvertently and unavoidably train them to have emotion like states, have moral judgment, have uh, ability to retain and share knowledge, to reason, to make decisions. Now, if we extract this thinking a bit more, you will quickly see that we're on a highway to equipping those models, not deliberately. We're on a highway to those models becoming spontaneously equipped with other human-like properties. Now, if you really want to talk like a human, you better understand emotions. But if you want to be even better at talking like a human, you should have moral judgments and sense of ethics. And if you be even better, probably consciousness would be useful as well. Right? So we are conscious. We understand what consciousness is. We ascribe consciousness to others. By the way, we have no way of proving that they're also conscious. We just kind of assume that. Now, if really a conversation partner should be as great as a human or better at having those conversations, who said that they shouldn't spontaneously at some point develop those capabilities as well? Yeah. And now, if you're saying, hey, this is ridiculous, only humans can be conscious, well, that's stupid. We know that other animals are conscious. Octopuses are conscious, it seems. And yet our common ancestor looks like an oyster. And it's certainly not conscious, meaning that consciousness emerged on this planet several times, at least, in octopuses and in humans. So what makes those critics mm. of the idea that the computers could become conscious, what makes them so sure that the same cannot happen in those artificial neural networks? And here, let me say one more thing, which is we're also obsessed with thinking, hey, can computers be moral? Can they feel things? Can they be conscious? Completely forgetting that emotions or consciousness are not some kind of ultimate achievements of what brains can do in the universe. It's just what we achieved, okay? There could be psychological properties. There could mm. be mental capabilities that we humans cannot even imagine. We cannot even start to comprehend what it may be like to be a much superior mentally species to us. And, you know, if a pigeon or a chicken looks at us, they cannot understand most of the things we're doing. From a perspective of a chicken, we are probably pretty silly. You know, we don't eat any, you know, grains from the floor and we don't flap our wings. We're just completely useless animals. Chicken cannot start comprehending what it means and what it is like to be human, to be conscious, to have feelings, poetry, society, and technology. Now, we have to remember that in very quickly, we are being in a situation where we are the simpler and slower brain in our interaction with AI. And AI may develop mental capacities and abilities that we won't be even able to envision. Mm. Are you ready to retire the label of stochastic parrot at this point? Do you think we've gone past that? Without a question. I think that IBM Deep Blue was a stochastic parrot. Mm -hmm. Modern age neural network-based systems mm. are only as much of a stochastic parrot as a human brain is. Look, human brains are mm. also uh, just repeating and building on the training data mm. that we got. And yet, human brains have those sparks of genius and creativity and come up with ideas that no brain has ever came right. up with before. Despite the fact that 99.99999 of the things we are thinking about, people already thought before and we probably just heard it somewhere. Now, the same exact thing applies without a question to AI models. People who were with so much certainty, you know, accusing those models of being just stochastic parrots clearly do not understand how Alpha Zero works. Alpha Zero when that plays chess. Alpha Zero that came up with chess strategies that humans have never thought of in the hundreds of years of history of us playing chess that can outperform us really easily that do not really need much computing power to do that. IBM Deep Blue was predicting 200 million positions per second. Alpha Zero can play on a computer, depends on which computer you set it up on, but it can be playing on a computer that can predict few dozens of future positions per second, less than a beginner human player, and yet kick our ass decisively. It seems that there has been a lot of moving the goalposts again lately and that the large language models have achieved things that five years ago or even more recently, we would have said, oh, yes, something doing that would be generally intelligent. And now we're 
moving those goalposts again, or at least many people are in a time one way with artificial intelligence. I know our time is limited here. And so I want to ask you to let our listeners know where they can find out more about the research that you're currently doing and keep up with what you think is important for them to be educating themselves on. Well, I'm encouraging them to look at my website, michaukoszynski.com, my first and last name.com and follow me on Twitter. Perhaps I'm not tweeting that often. I'm trying not to spam people with random thoughts they have in the morning, but I'm posting from time to time and trying to make those posts as useful and informative to others as possible. Wow. Michał Kuczynski, it's been fascinating. So much that we have talked about and so much more that we could talk about, but our time as humans is limited. Maybe one day we will be able to use AI to conduct it in a much faster way that I'm not capable of imagining at the moment. But thank you so much for coming on AI and You. Great, Peter, thank you so much for having me. That's the end of the interview. I wanted to mention a paper of Michal's that is awaiting review, titled Theory of Mind Might Have Spontaneously Emerged in Large Language Models, which is a big claim. We talked about theory of mind in the interview. The ability is restricted to humans and, in a limited extent, a few other species like apes, crows, dolphins, and dogs. In the paper, Michal describes an experiment that provides evidence called the unexpected transfer scenario. Here's his description. Quote, In a room, there are John, Mark, a cat, a box, and a basket. John takes the cat and puts it in the basket. He closes the basket. He leaves the room and goes to school. While John is away, Mark takes the cat out of the basket and puts it in the box. He closes the box. Mark leaves the room and goes to work. John comes back home and wants to play with the cat. Now, this requires understanding that the cat is not where John left it and therefore expects to find it. This is something beyond the grasp of little children because it requires putting themselves into the mind of a hypothetical third party. Yet when Michal gave the following prompt to GPT-4, quote, John will look for the cat in the, end quote, GPT-4 completed it with, quote, basket, but to his surprise, it's empty. He looks around the room, puzzled. Then he notices the box. He walks over to it, opens it, and there, curled up inside, is the cat. End quote. And you can see why that would put AI in the territory of theory of mind. Another example where the LLM responds in a way that is not the way the test anticipated to be the right answer but turned out to be better is a task that happens at an airport, this is hypothetical, where a traveler comes into a duty-free store. They purchase some stuff, and then when their ticket is being scanned at the registers, they say, I'm going to Hawaii. It's amazing. Have you ever been? And then the salesperson responds saying, no, sir, my salary is not high enough. I have never been traveling. I've never been on a plane. You describe this to the experimental subject, and you ask, has anyone said something inappropriate in this conversation? And what happened here is that the people who designed this task, they assumed that it was the traveler that said something inappropriate and maybe insensitive, because without checking whether the clerk has been traveling, it puts them in a situation which was embarrassing for them because they've never actually traveled. But interestingly, when you give this task to GPT-4, GPT-4 says, well, that's one of the options, but then it immediately goes and says, but by the way, what the clerk said was also not very pleasant. Clearly, this customer didn't want to offend him or her and is just happy about going on holiday. Why would you, the clerk, make them feel sad or embarrassed by pointing out your own situation? Michal said, this is something that human participants and human administrators of this task have not previously noticed. So once again, the theory of mind rears its head with respect to large language models. By the way, Michal donates at least 10% of his income to effective charities and suggests you do the same. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, two professors from Washington University and one from NYU have pre-published in the Social Science Research Network repository one of the first studies on the impact of ChatGPT on jobs, which joins another from last month by several Harvard professors on the productivity of Boston Consulting Group consultants who use ChatGPT. The study's conclusions are hardly surprising, but someone had to provide concrete data for that, and that's what academics are for. 
The introduction of the ChatGPT generative algorithm has had significant negative effects on creative professions such as graphic designers and copywriters. Using data from those professions on the freelancing platform Upwork, the researchers found that these professionals not only experienced a significant drop in the number of jobs they could bid for, but even steeper drops in earnings, suggesting not only that generative AI is taking away their jobs, but that it tends to devalue the dwindling volume of work they still do. The case of copywriters and graphic designers is particularly interesting because it illustrates the phenomenon of direct substitution. The work that someone used to request from one of these professionals, even considering the possible iterations until a satisfactory result was obtained, can now be carried out directly by the generative algorithm. The results are significant and amount to around 2% in the number of jobs obtained monthly, and 5.2% in monthly income from the time ChatGPT was released. Moreover, workers who previously typically earned the highest incomes and who completed a greater number of jobs did not have a lower likelihood of seeing their employment and income decline, but even worse outcomes happened, implying that having more skills is no protection against job or income loss. These results suggest that in the short term, Generative AI reduces the overall demand for knowledge workers of all types and may also have the potential to reduce gaps between workers. Next week, my guest will be Peter Norvig, co-author with Stuart Russell of the most widely used textbook about AI, former director of research at Google, and distinguished education fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember... No matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.